So this uh, topic is dealing with drought, uh, which seemed very apt given that we are in the American West, but it's a common problem around the world and it's getting worse. Um, and so it's something that we wanted to dive into in this conference. Uh, I think we've got a lot of meat here we can go over, um, but we'll see where it goes. So I'm going to let each individual panelist introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about um, why you're up here, what you do, um, and kind of um, um, you know, what you want to talk about a little bit. So give us a couple of minutes introduction from each of you. I, don't know, I guess I'm first. That would put you first, okay. Colin. <laughs> Is this hot? Yeah. Yep. I am uh, oh, what you would call here in, in, in the US a uh, uh, farmer and rancher uh, in Australia, and I'm obviously from Australia, from my accent. Uh, in Australia, that's called uh, uh, farming and grazing. So I, I guess I'm here because I developed a different way of, of growing crops, but that's not why I'm here on this panel. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk, I think, about, um, about grasslands, but grasslands and species diversity of grasslands. Um, then you'll start, we'll, we'll start to build soil carbon, uh, start to build a bit of hold, water holding capacity, um, but then I'll, I'll pass it on to Courtney to add his bit. Uh, I, I'm Courtney White uh, from Santa Fe, New Mexico. I co-founded the Kivira Coalition, which I think a lot of folks in the audience uh, know. We have an annual conference in a, a month or so from now. Um, and uh, I'm not a farmer or a rancher. <laughs> I don't have any animals that I manage. Um, what I've tried to do is sort of um, scan for practices that solve problems and write about them. Uh, I've written some books, and we have highlighted a lot of these practices uh, in our conference and our work in New Mexico. Uh, I have a new book that's out. I have to show it to you. It came out, I saw it just the other day for the first time. It's over here at Chelsea Green. And in it, we talk. I talk about a variety of practices that do a lot of regenerative things, including a drought management, two of which, depending on how we cut up the conversation here, I'd like to talk about as well. I'd also like to talk a little bit, um, kind of a higher level and, and define a little bit about what drought is, mm -hmm. uh, not just the practices that solve the problem. A lot of us are familiar with those. But, um, you know, New Mexico has had a, some dry times, and I like dry times better than drought. Drought implies that there's an end to this. What if things just change, get drier, stay drier, that kind of thing. So Joe's next. Um, <clears throat> I'm Joe Morris, and, and um, I'm a... Uh, I had a really hard time picking just one dot from the offering. I was going to make kind of a rainbow because researcher, scientist, cowboy, rancher, consumer, etc. Um, so that's kind of my background. I, I, I had an affinity for holistic management as soon as I saw um, the concept in a, in, a, in a world magazine, a world monitor magazine in 1990 or so. Um, and um, I was born with my boots on, as my family tells me, and I thought, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And so I've been uh, working out the details of that's what I'm going to do since, uh, since I read that article. Um, and I'm really glad to be here with you today. I was reminded as I walked in here uh, by someone from New Mexico that said, you haven't been in a drought as long as we have. And I said, well, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Zachary Jones. I, am, I think everybody in this group, when we got invited just the other day to be on this panel, it's pretty, pretty cool. We all emailed around saying how humbled we were to be on a panel of such great people. So we all complimented each other, which is, which is really good. So it'll be good to see the humility and experience on this panel, I, I hope. Um, I'm a co-founder of Grasslands LLC, um, the management arm, an asset management arm, or, or sister, you could say, of uh, Savory Institute. And so right now my main role in um, life is to help grow Grasslands LLC into, into, into more influence across more hectares and acres, um, but also then help coordinate the management of all of our resources and farms and, pe and people. So um, today I think on the panel I'll try to the, the species I want to try to play here on this panel is is taking a um, not just a global perspective, but but how to uh, manage the flow of um, 
of droughts on farms and ranches on, in multiple areas in the world at the same time and, um, and how to manage with that. And so I want to talk about kind of consciousness and how we actually think of what drought is. Thank you. My name is Judy Schwartz, and I'm a journalist and author. And from a water perspective, in a way, I don't belong here because I live in Vermont, where we have plenty of water all the time and in multiple forms, um, like a lot of snow. Um, so I wrote a book about soil called Cows Save the Planet. And one chapter in that was about water and the connection between soil and water. And I, after, after that, I wasn't done with this topic. So I've, I'm just about done with a new book, which is called Water in Plain Sight, Hope for a Thirsty World. And in the book, I explore water from a holistic per perspective. So in a sense, what I'd like to be able to, well, what's been on my mind a lot, and so I, I'll probably want to jump in and talk about is basically water as process, water processes, as opposed to water as a noun. You know, we often talk about water as this thing that we divide up and you get some or I get some and there's none over here, but there is over there. But, but how does water really work? Because that will give us tremendous insight as to how to deal with challenges like drought. Yeah. yeah, and that's a great point. We have all the water in the world, and, and our, um, our, our planet is known as the blue planet around the globe. Uh, I mean, around the, the, <laughs> around the universe, you, you look at our planet, we're the blue planet. We've got all this water on here, uh, but it's really an allocation issue. So I really liked where you guys went. Let's talk about what drought is. Let's, let's, let's riff on that a little bit. Maybe, Courtney, start with you. You, uh, you started to go into that a little bit. Let's go in a little more depth. Yeah. Um, so in New Mexico, wh where I live, the, let's let's just pick a part of New Mexico that gets about on a hundred-year average, 14 inches of rain. If that drops over time due to global warming, whatever you want to call it, to eight inches a year, is that a drought? Are we in a drought? Are we in a a, a, a period of of increased dryness, hotter temperatures, things like that. I, see, I worry a little bit about the word drought because it does imply a, a, at the other end of it things will return to normal. Uh, and they might. We had a wet year this year. Uh, many of the ranches saw 18 inches of rain this year, and those, those who managed appropriately have seen a rebound in the grasses and things. But in the, in the, the general long-term trends that I, I have seen for, for the Southwest, it's you know, it's down, down, like that. So I worry a little bit about how we use the language here, the language of drought, uh, what the climate, and we're getting, we may even get uh, a change in precipitation patterns, it may look like similar amounts of precipitation annually, but really under hotter and drier conditions, mm. which is, you know, lack of soil moisture and things like that. So I just, you know, I, I, I worry a little bit about uh, this kind of, um, you know, what is a drought? If we just kind of hang in there long enough, wait for the El Nino to come and save us, um, then we'll be okay. So I, 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 you know, I'm trying to encourage folks where we are to, to think more long term, think about if it does drop to eight inches precipitation, what do we do? And not just ranchers and farmers, this is an issue for cities. And fundamentally, the conflict between rural and urban over water, which is going to rise, I think, over time. It'd be nice to get ahead of that here as we can. So I, it, again, I just I, the word drought uh, implies something. You know, I, I think we should broaden the conversation to think about hotter and drier times in general, and what do we do? And I think we should broaden the conversation to allocation of rainfall. And so if, if you've got a long period with no rainfall and then have one day of 18 inches, is your year saved? Well, no. All organisms want water every day. And so I think allocation is a much bigger piece of the puzzle that doesn't get talked about in the research or in the press. Uh, Judy, do you want to go off on that? You, were, you had some stuff that kind of the process of water. I really like where you're going with that. Right. Okay. So um, I echo Courtney's... Um, thought that the word drought can be problematic and also I think it's problematic because the emphasis is often what is falling from the sky mm -hmm. and when in discussions about the drought you very rarely hear about what's happening on the land 
So when, you, so when it's all about whether you're getting enough rain or too much rain or whatever, it leaves people feeling helpless. So I was thinking about what Jonah said last night when he was talking about the insufficiency model of communication. So it's all about that's the story that's being told about the drought, that it's insufficient. We can't do anything. We just have to wait until there's more rain and kind of bide our time and you know, fix our leaky faucets and all that. But, um, but really, so much, so much has to do with how much we can make use of the rain that does fall, what Alan talks about as having effective rainfall. And once we turn things around and start looking at the land function perspective, well, there's a lot that we can do to make that rainfall more effective. So that shifts the conversation from an insufficiency model, anxiety, to a, an agency model which is let's focus on what we can do about the land. Cool. Anybody want to add to that, Joe? Go ahead. Yeah, I really would. I, I love, uh, uh, I'm a liberal arts guy, so I, I like to define the terms of the conversation. And um, so this is really a great place to start because I think drought is, is, is basically when we don't ha have the precipitation that we believe we need. And... Um, when we believe we don't, when we believe we need something that we don't have, there's a sort of psychological claim on our on our brain that distorts our ability to deal with the current situation. And what I wanted to talk about today is how, you know, how holistic management helps um, address that that um, that 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 problem that we have when we have a psychological claim that distorts our ability to deal with the current situation. And I think holistic management is is um is is a just an incredibly uh helpful tool in that situation of adversity um uh because it's something that's that's written down that can help and we can write it down by you know using our smart brain in a period of calm that helps us when we're in a period that's not so calm when we have this 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 anxiety that Judy just mentioned um and so if we use that creativity that is, un, is systematically um, or systematized by the holistic management framework, framework we can address the, the, the anxiety that is experienced during, during a period of adversity, drought, um, and we can actually become better off from the time drought begins to the time drought ends because we are in businesses or in lives that are dependent on water. What we're really dependent on is our own creativity. And I love that uh, uh, Judy mentioned that, that, that we are agents. And the most powerful gift, I think, that, that Alan and the people who have cultivated this holistic framework have offered us is that it empowers us to be agents, creative agents, uh, in a world that is fraught with diversity and change and uh, all kinds of uh, evolving situations that we need to be ever more creative to uh, thrive and prosper and be happy. So, Joe, while I've got you there and while you've got the mic, why don't you describe for anyone who may not know what holistic management is, the whole thing. How many days do we have? That's right. Well, uh, how many of you have ever had the thought, you know, I need to write that down because if I don't, I'm going to forget it? Pretty much everybody. Um, yeah, I do too, and so I wrote it down. <laughs> but basically, um, what I believe holistic management is, it is a systematic approach to uh, uh, the human creative process. And if you think, if you ask an artist how they do work, uh, uh, say it's a, a painter, they will be faced with a blank page and paints. And what their process is, and they can cultivate this process so that they can become really good artists is that they, they can deeply imagine uh, the painting that will come onto that great, onto that blank page as soon as they apply their, their skill and imagination. Then they can also understand exactly where they are today. They have an imagined painting, they have a blank page, they have paints. So when they do that, they create a tension between the current situation and what they'd really like to have. And that tension in the brain, in the human brain, 
begins to uh, uh, create creative outcomes. It begins, attention drives them forward towards what they really are imagining. Well, that's the holistic management framework in, in a nutshell. We imagine very deeply what we'd like our lives to be um, like. We'd like, when, and we also imagine those components of our life that support our values, the, you know, the economic and work part has to be in a certain way for our values to be realized. The resource base, the land in many of our cases, um, in all of our cases actually, um, more or less directly, has to be a certain way in order to support our lives of work and economics, to support our lives of value and, and, and peacefulness and so things. So, so that holistic management framework is, is, that's the context, that's the imagined reality that is not the current situation. The current situation might be drought. So then we come up with strategies to produce that current, that, that imagined reality that we want to make real. And the holistic management process gives us means to test all the varieties of, of, uh, of means of getting there that can help us uh, get there as quickly as possible um, and as directly as possible. Um, and, and that's as far as I'm going to go right now. <laughs> Perfect. And, and then, Zachary, why don't you tell us what holistic planned grazing is as a subset of that, uh, just for anyone who might not understand the difference. Well, holistic plan grazing is about, you know, the, the macro and the micro management of all dynamics in life <laughs> on your farm or ranch at any one time. And um, it's, all, it's all prepared to not only make sure you know that you're going to be gone at your sister's wedding, so no one's going to be around to move stock for two days, um, but it also, it primarily all focuses in so we know exactly what we need to do to try to influence the soil surface. And to influence the soil surface is the most important thing, and then to monitor our ecosystem processes. And so I'd like to, to slip in here into, into thinking about ecosystem processes. And when we look at those through the lens and look at water cycle, as we all know, water cycle, energy flow, mineral cycling, community dynamics are all, all interdependent in the whole. Drought is usually, we think of um, the water cycle being drought, but it's all things together. I think drought can be a symptom of poor grazing and poor human decision making. Um, I think it, when it's a symptom, we can address that symptom with actions and change our behavior and, and plan our grazing accordingly. But I also think a drought is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And just as, um, and I'm, I really like sitting next to Joe here because he's, I never had the opportunity to be a liberal arts um, student like Joe, I, I went down a more narrow track, um, but I like to get quite philosophical at times. And I think if we think of drought um, being inevitable, it's kind of, um, it's like a day. And, 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 and as the earth rotates around its axis, we have night, dawn, midday, dusk, and then night again. And where do you draw a perimeter or a membrane around those holes within the hole that creates a whole day? And so drought, I believe, when it's inevitable and not a symptom of poor management, if it is inevitable, I think we need to do a better job as, as, as a species of embracing that as part of, of, as part of the whole. Um, and why do I say that? Well, now that grasslands is managing properties or like is dependent on properties in New Mexico, Oregon, Montana, South Dakota, Hawaii, Florida, and the high country and the irrigated plains in New Zealand, um, every day we get an email or a communication about something bad that is going on somewhere, whether it's somebody getting hurt, um, somebody doing something really well, or drought. And so if every day you're faced with drought somewhere in the world, which we all are in the world, everybody is interdependent in the world, and every moment somebody is dealing with a dry time, do we view that as bad or do we view that as part of the whole? So um, using holistic management, let's address if drought is a symptom of our decisions or if it is inevitable, how do we use holistic management and plan grazing to manage that inevitability within our economic, social, and ecological context? Right, right. So let's, let's pass the mic down this way. <clears throat> and so in practical terms, 
what can ranchers do or grazers or farmers do to make rainfall, what rainfall they get, more effective so that it gives them the maximum output to get to the goals they want? So let's, let's go down the line with that. Okay, I'll, I'll just add something before I start. Okay. There's actually no such thing as drought. Now that'll upset some people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, drought is just a word that we've invented for natural periods of lower or variable rainfall. It's how we manage those lower, ra lower periods of rainfall that is, is the difference. Um, and we can. Um, I really don't see this as a major problem. Maybe I'm an optimist or something, but <laughs> <laughs> if we mimic the function of natural systems, if we mimic nature a lot closer, they are not problems. We're the ones that create the problems. Now, to answer your question, <laughs> grasslands and grasslands that, have, that, that used to be all over this planet were very well designed, for the want of a better word, to manage these dry seasons very well. You know, native people really knew how, how to manage, manage our grasslands. In other words, what, what's happened is that we've lost most of our grasslands and in saying that we have lost species diversity out of our grasslands. In other words, most of the grasslands that we have around the world now have lost many of their species where the rainfall is lower naturally. Some areas have lost their, their, their winter growing species, their, their cool season species, which are called C3 grasses. In other areas of the planet, we've lost our warm season grasses or, or our C4 grasses. And we've done that because of poor grazing management. If we restore these grasslands so that we have a mix of, of warm and cool season plants, um, then we will fix most of our, of our so-called drought problems. Then we will start to sequester carbon and build soil carbon levels. Then we will have better water holding capacity in our soils. Then we won't suffer from droughts. Let's go down the line. Um, <clears throat> So at our conference this year, we're going to have a speaker from West Texas, Christopher Gill, who's a rancher who um, is going to title his talk, Drought Busters, for $10 an acre. He is a very interesting person. Uh, he, has, he does holistic management. He also does a lot of uh, riparian and kind of creek restoration stuff. But the key to his, the key practice that, that he employs, which is the last chapter of the book, something that I hadn't really thought about until I met him and talked to him, and he sent me a video, which I'll try to show tomorrow if we can. Um, he, he employs a, uh, the key line design and a yeoman's plow. And this is West Texas. This is very dry country. He has, has a lot of bare soil, and a lot of it was overgrazed and damaged historically. And when the first time he explained this to me, I thought, what, what is he talking about? Um, I've since come to, and talked to other folks, since come to believe that this is a, an underutilized and potentially important tool. Uh, a practice, again, if you don't know, uh, as an Australian yeoman's, uh, kind of a long story, but it's a, it's a, it's a uh, sort of a no-till drill that he they, they pulls on contour, it kind of breaks up compacted soils, the water gets in. He gets a lot of vegetative response for a very little bit of money, and then the grass and the weeds come up, and then he manages them with the cattle, and he's also working the riparian areas, and he gets this sort of phenomenal infiltration of available water, kind of what Colin is talking about. You know, how do you how do you manage what comes along um, in a very dry environment? Uh, and again, it's on contour, and he works on, on a thousands of acres scale. He takes he has a drone. They take pictures of it, which I'll try to show tomorrow. But it's uh, it's he's he's it's a very interesting combination of of sort of no-till drilling in a dry country and then animal management with riparian restoration. And he says that uh, he'll never worry about drought again. It's a very interesting process. Well, I like the concept that drought doesn't real, isn't real. But um, my experience over the last couple of years is that it seemed real. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's that's one of the points. It, is it it it's a it's a perceived approach to reality as opposed to looking at reality, and um, that's that's problematic. So, what I found is that 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 people were talking about drought, about drought. I was talking about drought, but I was practicing holistic management, holistic planned grazing, and um, there are things in holistic planned grazing that that. 
um, encourage you far in front of where you're in a crisis to be planning. Uh, and what we were planning for was to, uh, we don't know when the dry time's going to come. We don't know that date. But we do know when we have soil moisture. And we can do a lot during the times we have soil moisture to prepare for when that dry time comes to, to, to make sure that the soil surface is covered and that there's forage for the animals or that there's not too many animals. There's a whole slew of things that we can actually do practically to, to, um, to address the symptoms of drought and to avoid that problem of getting, oh my gosh, I have too many animals, therefore I need the rain that's not here and I'm really anxious and I'm going to go broke and it's just people get depressed, they jump out of windows. It's really, it's really a, a terrible thing. Um, so we didn't have drought for a while. My neighbors had drought. They were really worried. I got rid of some of my cattle, whatever happens. Um, I adjusted my, uh, I looked really closely at my gross margin analysis per unit of acre, you know, per acre, to make sure that whatever I was doing was providing the most return per acre uh, in a way consistent with my values so that my family would thrive in this time that was like, it was getting very serious. Finally, I got to the point where I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do because the drought had somehow crept up on me and I still had all these animals and there weren't, wasn't any rain coming and I thought, this is really a disaster. So people encouraged me, hey, look, go back to the holistic plan planning model and see, see what's there. And, uh, and, and that in and of itself, using the power of community, that power in embedded in the statement that two heads are better than one to address problems that we can't really figure out is really important and is completely tied to the, the holistic management model because it talks about a resource base. Well, normally, almost in, invariably, our resource bases are larger than we, than we think they are. And, uh, and we found a way out. And, and that's that agency that is brought to us by uh, creativity. I think it's... Uh... It's a, I found myself getting a, and I see Tony in the crowd there as well in grasslands, we found ourselves at times, it's, it's dangerous when you start thinking about drought, especially when you get to individual farms within a, a region that are experiencing dry times. And, um, but we need to simultaneously hold on to the fact that we, we can change the ecosystem processes and, and what the soil surface is like to be more effective with moisture and growing conditions, um, but you can't do that immediately. You can make a decision and an action by staring as you're on your horse or driving or walking at the soil surface and constantly thinking about diversity and energy flow and mineral cycle and you know community dynamics, just constantly thinking about that. That is what our practitioners on the ground, our managers, our crews, everybody can do right now is address the soil surface. However, um, that doesn't change things significantly sometimes enough so you're economically um, viable to where your family is happy and safe or your neighbors um, or the ecosystem is doing well. And so maybe something I can add here is if you bring in investors that are foreign to, um, we're all foreign to actually managing landscapes properly, but if you bring in investors that now are going to own properties that you as a manager are communicating to what's happening, how do you create an investment model that sets and quantifies but also emotionally communicates what dry times are? And um, so we have a responsibility as, as people to not only manage the soil service but also manage the monitoring and the communications of dry times or wet times Right. to our investors. And I think that um, Tony and Jim and I and everybody on our team, we've learned a lot about embracing um, adversity but communicating it with the big picture in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so we should think about that as well. How do we deal with it within a region, not devalue that it's immensely stressful to the people in the region that have dry times? Do not create a social week link with them by saying drought doesn't exist because it does right there, right. but how can, you, how can you focus on the big picture in the long term and, yeah. and have wealth there too? And I liked what Joe said, it, it does in your mind. It's what you believe. If you believe you have less than you need. Okay, I'm gonna give an example of thinking creatively about water and drought, and I'm going to follow Courtney to West Texas, far West Texas. And so um, in my reporting, 
I um, went and visited this couple who work with dew. They work with condensation. And it was really interesting because um, the place that we stayed, um, you know, they were saying, oh, there's no water, there's no water, you know, I don't know how we're going to last, the drought's going to do us in. And what this couple have, have done is they have designed their, um, dwe- sort of their dwelling, their workspace that they call the rain barn. And they've designed it in a way that they collect water from the roof. So they have enough water in this very, very dry, droughty place. Um, is really interesting. I mean, the technicality of it, I can't quite um, convey, but, but it's the way that the roof, there is airflow and condensation comes, and anyway, it, I can explain it better um, another time, but also, so they've created this whole ecosystem based on condensation, they, and also the way that they put their plants, it's so that they get the dew, the, the benefit of the dew in the morning, and yet it's shaded so that that can work its way into the plant. Um, this probably is not applicable to a large ranch, but just thinking, I was just so taken with the way that they have done this creatively and the way that they have taken inspiration from nature, from the um, Namib beetle that gets all of its water from dew in um, the southwest desert in southern Africa. So Judy, while I've got you, for there may be some people that don't understand this process, and we've got a lot of people that are also watching online. Can you explain in the simplest terms how livestock can be used to make rainfall more effective? Aha, uh-huh. um, in multiple ways. Okay, so um, so livestock have an impact, a tremendous impact on the land, and that impact can be positive or negative depending on how the animals are managed. So in a, one of the ways that they impact is through their hoof action. So an, an animal can be on a landscape and they, their hooves will create little pools. And I remember, remember that I spoke to Zachary about an example where it was simply the hooves on the landscape that allowed a ran- his ranch, family's ranch in Montana to withstand a flood whereas neighbors lost equipment and animals and bridges and, and all of this. So that's, that's one way. In another way, they're dunging, and they're dunging on, the, on the land adds organic matter to the, the land, the, to the soil, and organic matter is huge in terms of the land's ability to hold moisture. So um, you, you want the water to stay on the land. I think, it, I think Nicolette mentioned this, that it was about every 1% increase in organic matter is the equivalent of 20,000 gallons of water per acre that can be held in any rain event. So, so that's another way. And then yet another way is they're trampling in the <coughs> the dying and decaying grasses creates a a mulch and that keeps water from evaporating and holds water on the soil surface. Actually, I'll I'll just mention this. There's a a three-minute video that Alan has done that's called Making Rain Effective. And I've shown this to ranchers. It's a great clip. Yeah, it's three minutes and it just blew their mind because it, it showed how simply keeping that plant matter on the ground allowed rain to stay in the yeah, land. In essence, it takes, you know, it takes three sections of cap soil, just a couple of square feet. And in the first one, he just draws a square, and that's the control he doesn't do anything with. And in the next one, he just chips it up a little tiny bit, simulating animal impact. 
And the last one, he lays down some litter as though the animals had trampled grass there. And then on each, in each block, he pours the exact same amount of water. And in the first one, in, in minutes to you know, a couple of hours, the, it's completely dry. There's no measurable moisture there. And the next one that had a little bit of just that chipping, the water lasts for six to eight hours. And in the last one, 24 hours later, there's still water. You can still make a mud ball underneath that litter. Uh, so the value of that animal impact, even just in the moment, over time we're going to build fertility back into these soils, and that's the best way to hold water, is to build soil organic matter, and that humus is going to hold on to the water. Uh, organic matter is your smallest particle in the soil, which means it has the most amount of surface area, which means it's our strongest sponge. We want the most of that. But th what we're talking about here is what can we do in the interim when we don't have that organic matter there to get that cycle started. So Zachary, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, in a conventional setting, you would bankroll uh, some feed off to the side. You'd set some paddocks aside and go, okay, if I have a fire or a disaster or something come up, uh, I'm going to utilize that space. But then it never gets grazed. It's always just kind of sitting there fallow. What do we do in holistic management that would be different than that? Uh, and how do we bankroll for disaster? Well... I think uh, first of all, you need to, as Joe, as Joy points out, Joe points out, you're, you're thinking several months in advance. So, really, feed stored, whether it's in a pit or in a bale or in a barn, or on an area of land, or in uh, time spread out across your whole landscape. There, there's multiple ways to to have feed for a time of a natural time of of frugality. Um, I think what Chris might be be pointing out is the uh, the main thing that kind of holistic management really tries to let you think about, especially in brittle environments, is not to save not to save area for your feed for for that time of of frugality, but to think of your whole resource as being able to to reserve feed amongst the whole landscape or seventy percent of your landscape or twenty percent. Because if you, if you leave a certain portion of your ranch dormant just for when it's going to be dry, that whole landscape then is removed from animal impact and energy flow and, and stimulation and, and um, biological influences the whole, the whole time. So um, think of your whole resource not as, first of all, most, most landscapes don't need hay and don't need stored feed. You need to properly stock and build your economic context on what your land can produce. And you can do that by thinking ahead really creatively and, and, and disciplinedly. But also think in some landscapes, especially if your property doesn't have winter ground or doesn't have very good spring ground or is only for the summer, um, think about how your neighbors could be a part of um, supplying feed within that context. And that doesn't mean you call them up when you have an emergency. It means collaborating so you can use your neighbor's property for the strengths it has and your property for the strengths it has. Because our, our, our holes under management, as everybody up here would acknowledge, are, are primarily made and made up by humans, the lines we've drawn. So let's just kind of erase those, those borders in our ideal land plans and keep in mind the collaborations we could have for drought reserves with our neighbors. Right. Um, yeah, so if you need an 80-day recovery uh, to come back to an area and graze again during your growing season, uh, but you can bankroll, let's say, four or five days' time extra in there, you can build up a big bank of time that if something goes wrong, you've got other areas that now are recovered that when you come into those, even if half your farm burn, there's now places that have viable feed there that you can come into, and you're still not impacting that regrowth. So there's all sorts of different strategies we can attack there. Uh, Joe, I wanted you to talk briefly about uh, monitoring. You mentioned that in our pre-discussion uh, and the importance of monitoring and what can be done with that. Well, um, Peter Donovan is, uh, is, a, is a friend and mentor of mine and probably many people in here. And he, he, he says um, that monitoring is the best practice because we're always being asked, to, what's the best practice? Recommended best practices. And he says, well, monitoring is the best practice. And um, I think that's really true. And um, I've gone to a lot of these conferences over the years and sometimes been asked to speak or whatever. And... Um, be on a panel and so I've done it um, and I've told stories and so forth um, but over the last four years I've worked with the soil carbon um, coalition in their soil carbon challenge um, to do actual monitoring of soil carbon in on our ranches and uh, um, we did it first in two, 2011 and, and just 
last year or at the beginning of this 2015, four years, all four years have been drought uh, in California. And um, uh, in spite of that, the monitoring came back with a buildup of soil carbon, um, you know, 7% in the top 10, 10 centimeters, 11% in centimeters 11 through 25, and 5% and between 26 and 40 centimeters. And I was, I was really pleased on, with that. But it also um, really added significantly to the story I was telling because, um, you know, a lot of us are, are, are creative people and we're trying a lot of different things. But all of us need that, that monitoring to know, are all the creative things we're doing um, returning something to our, you know, our, our holes? Uh, are, are we happier? Are we more peaceful? Are we more wealthy? Are we more secure? Are we more resilient in terms of the, the coming dry period? And, uh, and, and so monitoring is absolutely essential to that. In fact, the first thing I do when I kind of get the sense that, that things are drier than I want to do is I go out and monitor. How much grass do I have in my paddock? What's the, what, you know, do these paddock assessments? All these little tools that are part of, you know, what we call holistic planned grazing are, um, are, are really critical. And, and, and they're thought out ahead of time. Um, so that when we do get in crises, like Alan was saying last night, you know, this thing was de developed for warfare, a uh, big crisis, um, and the thing, the step-by-step the, the -step aid memoir was developed so that you could, you know, deal with complexity and crisis uh, using your smart self that was really put to work in a moment of calm. Yeah. You mentioned something about monitoring? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I had a... Um, the uh, honor to be on the JX Ranch about a week ago. JX is a holistically managed ranch out in uh, eastern New Mexico. And there's, um, there's a monitoring protocol that's coming down the road. I think it's going to revolutionize uh, the, the whole monitoring paradigm. It's being developed by Greg Simons, who some of you know from the Desert Ranch uh, in, uh, outside Salt Lake City. Greg has come up with a, he's been working on it for about 15, 16 years now. It's, it's a quantitative system that he uses um, digital imagery of a five by six meter square of land looking down on it at a two millimeter scale. Then he then correlates it to satellite images of the whole ranch. So this is a holism. It's not transects, it's not hoops, it's things. It's, uh, and he has, it's all about uh, the new software and the hardware that's out. It's using a lot of high tech. And then he uses the Landsat, Landsat imagery that's flying over and it can go back in time 40 years once all those correlations are done. And so his crew was on the, this ranch. They could take 100 views, 100 views of five by six at two, two millimeter scales in a day and a half. So it's a quick process. It's highly quantitative. In that five by six meter square, he's getting 18 million data points, 18 million data points. At 100 views of a about an 8,000 acre ranch, that's about 2 billion data points. It's pixels. It's correlated then to the, the, to the what are you seeing on the ground, because they're, 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 they're looking at it very carefully, to the ranch-wide imagery. Um, then you get a sense of what's going on in the whole ranch. In general, he's looking at functional groups. It's bare soil. It's grass and shrubs, largely. But once you get those correlations done and you understand what's happening ranch-wide and then using the Landsat imagery looking backward, you can go back to 1972. So this ranch we are on was bought in 2003. It's kind of a dust bowl taken over by the Sidwells using holistic management. It's phenomenal what they've done with it. Now, Greg can come in with quantitative data, 18 million data points in a five by six meter square, and then look back in time and, and correlate prior poor management, continuous grazing, to what's being done today. It's uh, it's going to change. It's going to change monitoring. We won't, won't be doing qualitative monitoring once this cost comes down. We'll be doing this quantitative monitoring. I'm completely convinced of it. It's a Model T replacing the horse and buggy kind of paradigm once it gets and it's been peer reviewed and he'll have it out. But it's really going to change how pair monitoring is done. Uh, I think on ranches from from here here going forward. <clears throat> and the question I was going to ask right before that would be if the two of you had tools or farms or ranches that you would like to highlight or showcase uh, that are really shining stars uh, in all of this. And so that that certainly fit the bill. Would you have anything to add to that, Colin, or anything else that you'd like to add as we get close to a close here? 
monitoring is, is very important, like Courtney said, and that most likely has got huge potential. My own farm, I, there's, I've done a lot of monitoring on it and a lot of research work done on that. I'd just like to um, um, add something that most of the problem with drought is, is actually a financial problem that we, um, and one thing, coming from Australia, which is regarded as one of the driest, planet, driest continents on the planet, I and many Australians have had a lot of practice at managing dry seasons. We need to be adaptive. Uh, we certainly need to, to develop regenerative agricultural practices that will regenerate our landscapes. Um, and one of the big things is that they, we need to take the risk out of many of these, these things from a practical point of view, financial risk. So in other words, I believe a lot of our costs in agriculture, whether it's ranching or farming, are far too high. And if we can reduce a lot of our costs and take a lot of our financial risk out of it, then a lot of the problems with drier seasons are no longer problems. Um, and, and that's what I see in, in, uh, in, in travelling around, well, Australia, but the rest of the planet. I have horror stories of, of people, Australian, Australian um, um, ranchers, uh, graziers, spending three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars in twelve months just to keep their animals alive on on on, on stock feed. Terrible stuff. Um, so that's one of the big problems I see with, with dry seasons or droughts, um, is that financial impact that it has. Yeah. So th there's a lot of... Did I lose myself here? No. There's a lot of techniques out there that are available, um, but as you learn more about holistic management, we've got to test those against our holistic contacts to make sure they fit our own goals where we're trying to get as well as our financial context. And so that's an important point that I want to underline. Uh, about the monitoring piece, we have a session Sunday, uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. in room C, which is this one, about our new platform, which is coming out, which Trey Cates will be leading, um, that is actually a, a monitoring tool. So you can actually put all your data in there, and then that can be aggregated, and we can use it in different ways uh, amongst ourselves within the network. Um, we are also partnering right now. This is not launched yet, but we are in the process of right now putting together a project with Yale uh, using some remote sensing data uh, to create a, a similar program to what Courtney is talking about to where you get immense amount of data points that go back uh, 30 and 40 years when it ties in with Landsat. Uh, it's really exciting what it can do. It's uh, moisture is what we're measuring, but also percentage of bare ground, uh, specific species of plant, and you can actually see them fluctuate and change over time. So that's a really exciting development that's in the works. Uh, probably go to market a year to two years from now, uh, but we're in play with that now, so that's exciting. So thank you. This is a complex issue. Uh, I appreciate you, um, you know, sitting through the discussion. I appreciate our panelists for all your great insight and the, the stuff that you guys have put into this uh, and your background and your history and all your expertise you bring. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.